is a great pleasure to have our guest speakers here and thank you all for spending the coming hours with us. But before we start, I'd like to introduce our guest speakers first. Our first speaker is Professor James Landy. He'll give us an inspiring talk on how to provide active learning in context and stay for the discussion sessions. So Dr. Lande is a professor of computer science at Stanford University, specializing in human-computer interaction, and has a profound influence in that field. Previously, Dr. Lande was a professor of information science and Cornell Tech in the New York City, and prior to that, a professor of computer science and engineering at the University of Washington. His current research interests include technology to support behavioral change, demonstration, demonstrational interface, mobile and ubiquitous computing, as well as user interface design tools. He is the founder and co-director of the World Lab, a joint research and educational effort with Tsinghua University in Beijing. I'll introduce our two other panelists. We're honored to have Ms. Mo Fang with us. Uh, Mo has been at Google for 13 plus years, currently as the Senior Director of GTech Velocity. Previously, Mo led Google's computer science education efforts as part of the Google-wide Social Impact Initiative with the vision to help every student access the quality education they deserve, focusing on inspiring and retaining underrepresented students in computer science. Before she was the executive director of the Stanford Educational Leadership Initiatives and also an administrator and high school teacher in the Bay Area. Outside of work, Mo supports the Asian community through Stanford Asian Pacific American Alumni Club, TAPA, ASCEN, and ERGs. She also advises education startups as an HBS career coach for current students and alumni. Mo helps others explore path to define and achieve their full potential in life and work. During COVID, she is also homeschooling her two children. We're also very honored to have Mr. Jesse Kofina with us today. In addition to his work as the chief interpreter and translator for NG Play founder, Ms. Chen Xueqing, Jesse also authored numerous articles and essays on the history and practice of the NG Play approach, including the NG Play ecology of early learning. Jesse has lectured on the historical significance of the work of Ms. Cheng and the educators of NG County in China and organizations and institutions, including Google, Lawrence Livermore National Lab Laboratory, and BRAC. Jesse works closely with Ms. Cheng to translate the ideas and concepts of NG Play for a global audience. Together, they have identified pilot programs and cultivated practice leaders in North and South America, Europe, Asia, Africa, and Australia. Unfortunately, our old friend Joy Chen is not able to join us today, but we still want to thank her for her continuous support. So uh, let's just get started. Professor Lenze has been leading an interactive narrative-based learning system recently and aims to provide active learning experience in the context. So today he'll just share his insights on how technology can truly help us engage the students and trigger their passion for learning. And thank you, Professor Lande. Please unmute yourself and share your, share your screen with us. I'm James Lande. I'm glad to be here today to talk about some of our educational research that's jointly being carried out with folks in AI, like Dr. Emma Brunskill, and education with Professors Roy P. and Professor Dan Schwartz. I lived in China for two and a half years and it was an important experience culturally and for my research, my career, and my worldview. And my motivation for the Smart Primer project that I'm gonna talk about today came while I was on sabbatical in Beijing from 2009 through 2011. At the time, China had really shown the world that it could produce anything, including highly educated kids. And in fact, they were building a thousand new computer science departments, 700 new design schools across the country. And in fact, at that time and around 2010, Chinese middle school students came in first place in an international exam called the PISA exam. And I expected that people would be jumping up and down in joy saying, hey, we're number one. We even beat the USA in English. Um, now, I would take the test results with a grain of salt because some of the kids from elite Shanghai schools were on this test versus the US, I think it was more across the board. 
But when I spoke to people in China about it who were educated about it, they were worried that, yes, they had built a system where lots of kids could do well in school, but they were worried that the conformity and efficiency that was characteristic of the Chinese educational system was not producing the innovators and creators of the products of tomorrow and that it was out of balance. At the same time, the United States educational system seems out of balance, but in the opposite direction. Creativity and innovation are encouraged and often not even questioned, but the basics and things like reading and math and science are poor. So it was interesting to me to see people feeling that education was in crisis or out of balance on both sides of the world when it was so crucial to our future. Even worse to me was that school is not personalized to students. A significant segment of children are unmotivated in the traditional one size fits all education that was created as a scalable way to supply factory workers during the industrial revolution. I wondered how we might make a learning system that was more engaging and more personalized. Many are proposing minor tweaks on the existing learning model, for example, MOOCs and things like this. I think we can develop new solutions. When I was living in China in 2010, the Apple iPad came out. I couldn't wait to go back to the US and get one. Even though it was made in China, you couldn't buy it in China at first. And so I had a meeting in Washington, DC, and I went to that meeting, but what I was really looking forward to was getting up early the next morning, going to Crystal City, Virginia, to wait in line for my iPad. After I got this device, it really reminded me of a novel I had read 15 years earlier, in 1995, when I was a graduate student at Carnegie Mellon. This was Neil Stevenson's The Diamond Age. You see this pictured here. In this novel, there's a young lady who gets this tablet computer, which really looked like the iPad that came out in 2010. And this computer teaches her to read. It teaches her survival skills. It teaches her math. It teaches her writing. It teaches her stranger danger, all kinds of things in the form of a narrative story that she reads, but is asked to do activities and learning activities and other tasks to push the story forward. I, I thought at the time this would be an impossible thing to build that AI would never be in position to build such a thing. But 15 years later, when the iPad came out, I started to think maybe we could build such a thing. And I started to think about it, even though I didn't start this project till several years later. I imagine a narrative adventure that was embedded with learning activities that kids need to carry out in the real world as a way of engaging them in learning and making it more fun to do these things. So the activities have to tie into the story and the place where they live. Maybe these kids on the uh, left are measuring how far the frog has jumped and averaging the distances to do a, a math problem. Or maybe these kids on the right are measuring how much rain has fallen this month and comparing it to the prior months. So one of the things that my research group does first before spending years on a project is we try to come up with a concept video that gives an idea of what we are imagining on the part of the user and what their experience might be like. We're less focused on what the actual system might look like. And so here is the uh, concept video that we made for the Smart Primer project um, about four years ago. This was done by three Stanford undergraduates who worked over the summer to take our ideas and put it in the form of video. And this gives you an idea of what we're imagining the experience might be like. getting kids out of their houses. Most parents don't want their kids just behind another computer screen. And I also was wondering, could you give kids feedback when they do writing in real time rather than waiting for the teacher to do it and often not giving feedback on everything they write? Could we take objects in the real world near where they live and use that for learning? For example, this uh, snake wall was from bricks from the Loma Prieta earthquake that happened here in 1989. 
Or could we take everyday objects that you might find in the home, let's say a piece of fruit, and use it for a learning activity? In this case, making the measurements to understand the concept of pi. And eventually this device turning into a way to interrogate objects in the world that the child is curious about on their own. Now one of the advantages of making a concept video is it forces you to ask questions before you built the system. So in fact, our original video didn't have this last scene. And people asked, do you really imagine that learning is a solo activity? And we said, no. So we thought again about how multiple kids might work together in the system. So that concept video really was just a first taste of what we thought we might build and give us a chance to think about it. Now what I'm going to do is show you more of what we've been building and some of the experiments that we've done um, to show how well it works. So this slide represents an overview of the Smart Primer project. The idea is to have a narrative where we've embedded fun educational activities, included it on a personal media that a child can control on their own, whether a phone or a tablet, and then use physical surroundings, objects in the surroundings, location or other context or the student's own uh, previous learning skills to modify and personalize the narrative to them. Okay. So some of our goals for the project. One was we wanted to target kids pretty much elementary school age though we didn't want to focus on teaching people to read. So we were looking at about first grade to about sixth grade. Right now we've been scoping the project from fourth to sixth grade to make it a little easier to start. The learning content we've focused on is mainly core. So things like math, science, reading, writing, but we might want to expand over time to other useful skills like music or social science or life skills or even physical skills, almost like in the Diamond Age novel. Our scenario is meant to be after class, um, at home or in other informal learning settings. We aren't trying to replace teachers in this way. We're trying to somehow engage kids who may be less engaged in the current learning situation to be more interested and maybe that makes school more interesting to them. And then finally, our approach is this narrative driven, you might say almost gamified, but it's more of a story than a game learning experience. And so the idea is with Smart Primer, can we support practice and transfer by enhancing engagement and providing personalization? So more concretely, we are primarily interested in the three following research questions. The biggest question really is, does a narrative even help? Otherwise, it isn't worth even doing the entire project. So that's a question I said, we really got to look at, does narrative matter? The second one is, some of the learning activities will have points where kids get stuck. In a classroom, they might get help from the teacher or even a peer, but what do we do if they're working alone? Can chatbots help? Can we make effective learning chatbots? That's been a big piece of the technical research is to look at, could we make a learning chatbot? Could we make one that's not too hard to train? And would it be effective? And then finally, can we use context to make the stories and activities even more compelling? I'm gonna focus on the first two points in the rest of this talk. So this is an overview of what the smart primer system looks like to kids. There is a smart primer world that contains multiple maps. Each map contains five to six chapters that are connected to a general narrative arc. And each chapter has a story and at least one learning module. In this case, figuring out the volume of this box. Again, the chapters are connected though we might have completely different stories in different maps. Let's walk through a chapter to get an idea of this. So here you see this chapter where we have this character, um, the dragon that says, the Northern forest is currently facing a wildfire that is destroying the wildlife and villages. To stop the fire from spreading, we need to reach a meadow, the core in the middle of the forest. But first we need to cross the river. So then you, the student, Sherry looks around, you can't find a bridge and sees a boat. So the child and her adventure partner 
partner, the dragon in this case, which they've chosen at the beginning, appears the main protagonist in the story. They see this captain, they ask him to take him across, but he says, I'd like to take you, but I need to get this box of chocolates across. And you need to figure out the way of the box to see if the boat can carry both you and the box of chocolates. So the student gets this learning activity to figure out how many chocolates they could get in the box and how much it's gonna weigh. So they go through and they figure out the um, height and length and width and have to multiply it together and then eventually figure out the volume. So we tested this prototype with almost a dozen kids from ages 10 to 12 years old. And what did we find out? It was too long. The stories we originally wrote were too long. They were too hard. And in fact, as expected, their reading levels, their sophistication and their general interests vary. So in some ways that's support for the idea that this is gonna have to be a personalized adaptive story that adapts to different kids' interests, reading levels, sophistication, et cetera. We've since revised and iteratively tested the story as we went along. And in fact, we came up with two different versions of the same story that differ in complexity um, of activities and terminology. But building this first prototype raised some interesting research questions that we are now following as we work on the next version of the smart primer. One important question is, what do you do when they get stuck? So we've developed a tutoring chatbot based on a monster character that, as I said, the child chooses at the beginning. So this character is both in the story and acts as the chatbot that they can converse with. When a child gets stuck, this agent can provide hints that are adaptive to where they are stuck in the problem and their prior knowledge and skill. In the future, the chatbot could be even emotion adaptive and sense their emotion and maybe come in more when they know that they're needed rather than when the student necessarily asks. We recently completed a study where we tried to show the value of the narrative and the chatbot. So as I said before, I really wanted to know, does the narrative even matter? Should we even bother? So we had these four different versions, A, B, C, and D. Condition A is really our baseline. It's just the educational task of having to calculate the uh, volume of this box and eventually the weight of this box um, with no story around it. Condition B is the same task, but now we've added the narrative story. Condition C is that task, the narrative story, but now we add a hint system that is very similar to the hint systems that you find in common educational technology. In fact, it's really modeled on the hint system from Khan Academy. And then condition D is the educational task, the narrative, and instead of the hint system, it's a chatbot, but the chatbot can essentially only give the same hints that are in the hint system with the one difference is that the chatbot is, in this case, used Wizard of Oz methods, i.e. we had a person playing the chatbot, but they had a constrained script where they could only give the hints that are in the hint system, but they could give them contextually. So if they felt that the student was struggling with a particular uh, part of the problem, they could skip to that hint instead of having to go linearly through all the hints like the traditional hint systems um, do. So we brought in, 72 grade three to five kids into our lab and assign them to each of the four conditions. The conditions had equal number of kids from each grade and age level, as well as uh, gender balance. So what were the math tasks like? So as I said, the math task tries to be situated in this real world problem of calculating the mass and the weight of the box and whether the, um, the, uh, the captain could get you in the boat and the box across the river. It requires the students to use multiplication, fractions, and volume. And that was broken into six separate steps. And these steps necessary to complete the problem are based on common core standards. Each set of steps had a varying number of hints that you see at the bottom of this table, depending on how difficult the step was. So step one to three are the easiest, requiring only grade one math. Step four, you can see, and step five, are the hardest requiring grade four and five and grade three and four in math respectively. And thus they have the most hints. You see eight hints for step four, eight hints for step five, though there were only four hints total in step one to three. And then step six is fairly simple. You have the answer and then you have to decide, can you safely board the boat? Um, it only requires grade two math and has only two hints. So we had pre and post test quizzes that tested the same concepts as in the learning activity 
but with the numbers change. We counterbalance pre and post test problems across the students. Now I want to talk about our results. So our results are summarized in our IDC 2020 paper, which was led by um, Sherry Ron, who is one of my PhD students, which will appear very soon. We just turned in the final version of the accepted paper. So what did we find? We found two of the narrative conditions, B, which was just the narrative alone, and D, which was the narrative with the chatbot, were more engaging than the baseline A, which was just the solving the math problem. These were user reported scores based on a, a standard scale, user engagement scale, about how engaged they were. And you can see that those results are statistically significant. We also had judges look at video of the faces of the student. The judges were blinded to the condition the students were in. And using a standard methodology, they coded their effective state. So you can see again here, this is the percent time in each of these states. So you can see the highest percentage of time in the engagement state was in the chatbot condition, condition D. And you can see condition A um, was actually the lowest. In fact, condition A, the baseline, had the most time of all conditions in boredom, confusion, and frustration. So this result also leads evidence to the narrative conditions being more engaging. But what we're really interested is in, is there something more effective in terms of learning? You know, maybe you're more engaged to watch a movie, but if you don't learn anymore, it doesn't matter. As I showed before, that students did a pre-test and a post-test in this experiment that tested the common core skills learned in the activity. So fractions, multiplication, and calculating volume. We found statistically significant improvements in learning for the volume question when comparing the narrative plus chatbot conditions, so condition D again, to the baseline A. So that's where we saw a statistical difference. We also looked at where did people get stuck? So on the left, you can see where students started to drop off between the steps as they go from left to right. As they went from step three to step four, which was the one that required the volume calculation, you can see that many couldn't get the answer right when they were in the baseline which was the task only condition A, which is the green line, or the narrative only condition B, which is the orange line. So you see the green and orange line both drop significantly from around 95% or higher all the way down to 50% when they go from step three to step four. Those who had some sort of assistance, so the hints in condition C or the chatbot in condition D, the blue and red respectively, did better. You can see they almost went straight across the top at almost 100% with the chap up being higher and um, the blue hint system being slightly lower. On the right, you can see what, how these learning effects persisted when tested 30 days later. You can see after 30 days, we had them again do a volume problem at home. And you can see um, in the steps what happens here. On the right, you can see these learning effects have a clear gap between the chatbot condition D, which is red, and the other conditions. So of course, as you expect, after over time, some of the learning is gonna go away so that they've all reduced from where they were on the left. But you can see still that the chatbot system is um, showing the best and has a gap between the others. Again, more details on this are in the paper. So this study gives us evidence for the first two research questions that I asked at the start of the talk. First, the narrative does seem to have positive engagement effects. Second, the chatbot made it both more engaging and led to learning improvements, both on the post-test quiz and in a quiz a month later. Since we used the Wizard of Oz method to test the chatbot, we are now in the process of building a real chatbot and evaluating that automated version in a similar way. We've built automated chatbots before for uh, more college age kind of quizzing uh, systems, but we're, this really requires a different type of chatbot to be able to handle these kind of uh, math and science questions that are in the smart primer. Our research is also moving towards how to best leverage context and get kids outdoors while learning. I'll give you just a taste of some of our ideas there next. We believe we can use locations 
or objects in the real world to create learning activities in the narrative, much like Pokemon Go or geocaching, where you go around and look at GPS locations and almost a riddle to find an object that's been buried. Or we can use features of the real world for these activities. For example, a child might need to estimate the number of bricks in the brick wall of this old Coca-Cola ad as a math activity. We are building out some of the prototypes of these ideas right now, and we will again test them to see if they lead to more engagement and ultimately more learning and eventually have a system that puts these all together. The other long-term uh, activity we're doing is once we get the, the system with the chatbot working, we really want to start writing more and more stories and add more and more learning activities and see if we have longitudinal results with kids using the system over a number of weeks. So we believe with the smart primer, we can use active learning in context to help improve kids learning outside of the classroom. Thank you. I'd also like to thank our sponsors. TAL has been really the kindest sponsor of this project and really has helped me do this for the last two or three years. Um, very recently, we got a Google, a uh, small Google research grant that is helping us push the project forward. And also we have a, a grant we just received from at Stanford from the Stanford Center for Human Centered Artificial Intelligence or Institute, I should say. And I wanna thank our collaborators uh, from across the Stanford campus. Thank you, and I think uh, we have some time for questions, if that's right. Yeah, sure. Great time control, Professor. So we'll have uh, five minutes left for the Q&A session, and we've actually got a great question from uh, our register form. And the, the audience asks, how can we best integrate technology into uh, elevating meaningful learning experiences for both educators and students alike? Uh, we noticed that you are focusing on students' experience, and um, do you can you share any insights on how to engage the educators as well? Yeah. Yeah. So um, this is again, yeah. This project right here is focused on the students, but you can also imagine some of the data collected from a system like this giving teachers a better idea of how their students are doing in certain activities and know where are their spots that they might need to focus with them in school. So that's one way um, to deal with that. Another is uh, uh, another project, the one that was just uh, funded by HAI is with Professor uh, Chris Peach and Emma Brunskill again, and also some folks from education and psychology. And in that one, they're really looking at how can we use automation to figure out where children are having certain problems. And again, give them some feedback, but also give data from that for teachers to again understand where students are having difficulties so that they can focus their teaching and uh, classroom activities on the places where they're seeing kids have problems. So, you know, we don't see systems like this, of course, replacing teachers, we see them as tools that are gonna give them better data to understand where kids are struggling, whether on the aggregate or particular kids that will need extra help. So it's just another source. Teachers are really good at this as teachers by just seeing work and seeing how uh, students interact. But when they have a lot of kids to deal with, um, it gets hard to always get that right. So having another data source that can help them is really what the goal of that work is. Yeah, and uh, we got another question and it's about how to not just let children learn skills and knowledge, but to deliver the truly transformational experience as well as trigger their motivational passion for learning. And um, yeah, that's a pretty interesting question because we know that Smart Primer aims at trigger the passion for learning. So could you just share more about the differentiation between skills as well as motivation? Yeah, so I think um, some of the things that you see here are actually constrained by the way of doing research and how you can show that you made a difference and publish the results. So for example, doing a math problem isn't necessarily what I always want the system to be about, but that's something where there's a lot of uh, background on how you can test, pre-test, post-test, and show that there was actual learning gains going on. I think if you see the video, I imagine a lot more activities that may be more open-ended and may be more student-driven in terms of their own curiosity of what they want to go, and this might fit more with Jesse's uh, uh, work later of the student really driving what their learning is. And in fact, I can't even imagine a student using the smart primer 
for five years, let's say, like in the, in the novel, this little girl maybe uses it for 10 years or more. I'm even trying to go, how do you get someone to use this for a year? My imagination is that it's more of like a story that they're following along and doing activities they like that it engages them. But over time, it becomes more of a, almost a research or a lab notebook that just helps them capture the things they went out and wanted to learn about. Um, and it becomes, the scaffolding just kind of starts to drop away. So that's more of my longer term vision for it. I also think some of the other activities that we'll build will be much more creative and open ended. But those are going to be the ones where it's harder to just do a study where you're able to say, hey, we got this kind of learning game. But I think the longer term version of this will have both kinds of things from, you know, very skill based things like math uh, to very creative things like art or writing or just creating a story or an adventure of your own.